Welcome to this ministry special. I'm Debbie Frazier. We hope these programs continue to not only encourage you, but to encourage change in your heart and in your actions. What if God is calling you to even a deeper purpose through this pandemic? And how will you respond? Thanks for joining us. For more information on these specials, go to tln.com or tlnwest.tv, where you can find out how and when to watch these specials or to view them online. And let's start with this scripture, Micah 6, 8. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To explore that scripture and to join me today is the Reverend James Meeks, former Illinois State Senator and founder and pastor of Salem Baptist Church in Chicago. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm so excited to spend this time with you and all of our viewers and to discuss the very important matters that's before us. Well, I want to initially welcome you and the church. We want to first announce that you've joined our lineup uh, and Salem Baptist Church is now available across the network on Sundays at 11 a.m. And it's live at 11 in Chicago. And then in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's tape delayed at 11. So we're so happy to have your service on TLN. I am so excited to be with you. So excited to be with the TLN family and to join all of you around the nation in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, thanks again. And I've loved your services already. With the COVID-19 pandemic, it's more critical than ever before uh, to reach people through electronic means. How has Salem been doing since the shelter in place started? Well, you know, God in his divine providence blessed Salem to start uh, live broadcasting about 25 years. And so we were on television live and on a local station here in the Chicagoland area. And then we were already on Facebook Live. We were on YouTube Live and uh, we were streaming. We have a Salem app and our services are streamed. And so unlike other churches that had to scramble and come up with an online presence, we already had our online presence already in place. And it was as if the very next week when Nobody was in the building except for me and the camera crew, but all platforms were already set up. They were already available. And so we just continue to have service as if we were having service with people there. Very dynamic, I have to tell you. I have some quotes that we might be able to share a little bit later from one of your most recent services I've heard. But you've also been very active doing a series called Faith in Crisis. Can you tell us more about that? What happened is that we were on the same station that we're on on Sunday. We had airtime on Mondays, Tuesdays, uh, Thursday, and Friday. And we naturally, we were on Wednesday. So we were on five days a week. I usually play old services from weeks past, years past. But uh, when the COVID-19 hit, we decided that we would go live. And I don't know why in my sanctified mind, <laughs> that I was thinking that COVID-19 would maybe last a week or two. And I just decided to go live. And each night we were informing our congregation and the city of Chicago. So we would bring on different guests, different doctors, talk about where COVID came from, uh, how to you know, protect yourself, what to touch, what not to touch. And, uh, and it went on and on. And so after, after March, I found myself in April doing a show every night of the week in April. And then it went on in May. And I found myself doing this show every night in May. So what we've been doing is we have been inviting different people from the mayor of the city of Chicago yeah. to the, uh, our, both of our Congress people came, the, Tony Pretwinkle, the head of our county yes. government, she came and we've had all kinds of doctors on. And we've just been informing people on what to do and what not to do during the coronavirus. We also had prominent ministers on because really the show was designed to talk about how not to lose your faith in a pandemic. This is something we've never seen before. This is something that uh, is very deadly and it's very damaging. And so we wanted to give people the right information, but more than anything, we wanted Christians to hold on to their faith, to look to God, and to not give up. 
And so that's what we've been doing every night. And in fact, one um, program I remember specifically, very conscientious in you know, keeping your congregation safe throughout all of this. But one even, uh, evening you hosted the mayor, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and uh, as she was asking churches not to reopen, and I think Father Mike was on that night, and there were some other yes. pastors, and I think uh, the Reverend Je Jesse Jackson was there as well. Uh, and, you know, talk about that, um, the reopening of churches, and, and, you know, some pastors disagreed with that, but, but then you brought it to the forefront for a discussion in this series. Yeah, because what was happening is that, and I understand I understand that after we were, uh, we stayed at home for a while, we were locked in place, we missed church for about six to eight weeks. A lot of people were getting stare crazy, a lot of churches, they were anxious to see each other again and come back together as the fellowship that we've always known. And so uh, many of them were bucking against the government officials and said, hey, we have a right to religious freedom. I didn't think this was an argument about religious freedom. I don't think the government is trying to stop Christians from worshiping. I think it was a health crisis. And it was a matter of uh, if we come together, we can actually um, get each other real sick. And so I didn't see this as an argument of church and state. I saw it as an argument that had to do with health. And so we took to the airways to try to explain to people that, uh, how dangerous it is for congregations and large crowds to gather together. Deborah, uh, I've done funerals where uh, entire families, they were at a funeral and some person was asymptomatic and they ended up giving the virus to about 12 different family members. Now, these people loved each other. There's no way they wanted to hurt each other, but because you don't know when you have the virus, you don't know when you're asymptomatic, you can harm a lot of people. So we were discouraging churches from opening up. And I still encourage churches, those who cannot meet the social distancing requirement, those who will not wear gloves, those who will not wear masks, those who insist on having choirs sing. And when choirs sing, uh, there's projectiles that come out of uh, choir members' mouths, and we don't know what can happen to the saliva that's being passed. So I encourage people, and, and we'll talk in a few minutes about if we're going to open, how we should open, but I encourage people to not op open with no more than 10 members, and those people spread out. Thanks for addressing that. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, uh, it hit the African-American and Hispanic communities especially hard. And I believe you even held a special service for those that were lost to the pandemic. Is that true? Yeah. What happened was, you know, I was actually, I, I've been pastoring for 40 years. So that means I've done funerals for 40 years. Uh, and I know the um, pain, but the release that comes from a funeral. And when we started having COVID services and only 10 people could come to a COVID service, I started seeing family members having to decide who could come and who couldn't come. For instance, people couldn't come to their own grandmother's funeral. Um, grandmother had several grandkids. They had to draw lots to figure out who mm -hmm. would come. So it was no dignity in that for me. Uh, they couldn't properly hire uh, right singers to come in and perform solos. And uh, so we decided that everybody in the city of Chicago who had died of COVID-19, if their relatives would send us their picture and we would try to tell a story or say something about the individual's life best we could, we put them all up on a huge screen. And we had several ministers from the uh, South side, West side, North side. And one of the ministers for 10 minutes gave a eulogy to everybody who had lost a parent. Another person eulogized everybody who had lost uh, a child. The next person eulogized everybody who had lost a sibling. And then we did the last one, 
everybody who had lost a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, and just as a way of saying to people, your loved one's life is not in vain. We remember your loved one and we want to properly celebrate them. And so we had a citywide service for those who were lost of COVID. Talk about unity under fire. That's pretty, pretty cool. What have you learned through this pandemic? I really learned that we had more of an ability to reach out to our neighbors and to share than we were doing. And when I say we, I mean the whole country. I am amazed at how many food banks and food centers have been shed, have been opened up. I'm amazed at how many people who've been purchasing medicine for seniors. I'm amazed at how many uh, 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 stations have been set up so that people can do good deeds for other people. If we had the ability to do that when COVID hit, we had that same ability all along. And it's almost as if, and I will not ever say that God caused the virus, but in the midst of the virus, God has shown his people there is work that we could have been doing all alone. It took a pandemic for us to come together and decide that we're going to feed people and we're going to get medicine to people and we're going to make sure that in seniors' buildings, they have PPE and the things that they need. Well, again, this is something that we could have been doing all along. So I am, I am really grateful for all of the people who realize that we have to reach, we are our brother's keeper and we have to reach out to our neighbors. I hope that when the world returns uh, to what we call normal, I hope we don't lose this spirit of Matthew that said, when I was hungry, you fed me not. Uh, when I was uh, naked, you clothed me not. And when I was sick and in prison, you visited me not. And because now we're doing all of those things. I hope we don't lose this spirit once COVID is over. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now that the country's opening, and um, we touched on a minute, what is your plan for opening up Salem Baptist Church, especially in light of what you just shared? Well, I want to say several things about that. I want to say now that the country is opening, I want to talk to each individual for 30 seconds. Those of you who are watching, I want to talk directly to you. You are responsible for your own health and you're responsible for the health of other people. You may be asymptomatic. You may be a carrier. And so when the country opens back up and you go in public, the mask may not be for you to not get COVID. The mask could be for you not to spread COVID. And you really want to be sure that you always have your mask on when you are not six feet apart from people. Wear your mask, wear your gloves, continue to wash your hands, and continue to observe social distancing. That's for the individual. For churches, our church has anywhere between five and 7,000 people on a Sunday. There is no way we can open up and there is no way that we can open up and practice social distancing. It can't happen. The other thing that I'm afraid of about churches, we haven't seen each other now in 10 or 12 weeks People are going to be so excited to see each other. And we are people who hug. People don't want to fist bump or arm bump or whatever. We are people who hug. And so when we do open up, let me stay right there. We will have to figure out a way of having outside services. I think we're going to plan an outside service somewhere for the month of August where people stay in their cars and they watch on the screen just so that people people at the point now we have to scratch that itch they just want to come to the facility but we won't let people out of their cars and we'll have an outdoor service when we do have indoor services and i've been working with a lot of pastors we're trying to have indoor services uh, we've talked about proper social distancing we've talked about 
keeping the mask on the entire time you're in the building. Now that's real hard because churches, we sing. Singing is one of the things yes. that we do. It is hard to sing in a mask, but we must. In order to protect ourselves and everybody in that sanctuary, we must keep on our mask. And I encourage services, churches, because African-Americans, we can have two hour services. I encourage churches to limit that service 45 minutes, no, no longer than an hour, so that, watch this now, I know this is, people don't think of these things, but we have to make sure that people can use the washroom at home and get back home when it's time to use it again and not have to use the washroom at church. Because if they can't, the church will have to have an attendant in that washroom cleaning each stall when a, when a person goes in, then in and out. So it's just a lot of dynamics. If we can yeah. keep services down to an hour, if we could keep people in masks, we could keep people uh, six feet apart. Uh, we, we, we try to keep people six feet apart so they won't be six feet under. And that's one thing to remember. But if we could keep them six feet apart, have the ushers trained so that all the doors will be open, People will not have to open any doors. They come in, they sit down. And then last but not least, try to get people to give online so that nobody has to handle envelopes or nobody has to handle any money. Then those are some of the things that will make it easier for churches to open. Well, yours are beautiful services and it's a beautiful facility. Um, but your church is known for anointed worship, and, and many African American churches are with beautiful, large choirs. Uh, so I honestly uh, can't wait with you for those doors to open um, the way they once were. But as you say, we need to be uh, sensitive to those um, that are sick or that are weak or uh, I love the way you worded it, six foot distance so that people are not six feet under. And people, churches who love choirs, they'll, they'll have to be extra careful. It's going to be a while. I don't recommend that a choir comes together until there's a vaccine. There is simply no way that we can put a hundred voices in a choir area and ask them to sing. They can't sing in a mask and ask them to sing I just think that if there's anything we want to do, we have plenty of old tapes of our choir singing. Even in a live service, we can drop in an old tape of the choir singing and be just as happy about that song as, as if it was brand new. But we have to protect those people who sing in choirs. Pastor, we're not out of the woods yet with COVID-19. And then comes another issue in our country. We can't ignore the other main conversation happening right now, and that is the murder of George Floyd. What do you want to say to our viewers, white and black, about what happened and the nationwide response? Well, I think it's amazing. Nobody could have predicted this nationwide response over the killing of George Floyd. We've seen people killed before by policemen. We've seen it on tape. I do believe that God has, as Mr. Floyd said, he can't breathe. I do believe that God has breathed on this particular situation. My message is to the church of Jesus Christ. And I think that God is counting on us to make a difference in our society. I do not believe, we, yes, we have a problem of racism. I do not believe that God is going to give the answer to the government. I don't believe that he's going to give it to any po political leader. I don't believe the answer is going to be given to any civic organization. You ask me why? It's because if they get the answer and they solved it, they would get the credit. I believe that God wants the glory for solving the racial crisis. Therefore, the answer has to come through the church. And the church has to have a kingdom agenda for addressing racial matters. And when the church, I think that this is a marvelous time for the black evangelical and the white evangelical church to come together, to sit down, to fast, 
to pray, mm -hmm. to write a manifesto for how we're going to deal with this problem. I think God wants people looking to the church for the answer so that God can get the glory, so that people will look to church for other answers in their lives. So my hope is in the church that Jesus has built to solve this problem. Your work is not done yet, Pastor, I can tell with that. Do you think there's any relationship between COVID-19 and the reaction that George Floyd's death may have had, um, or are these standalone events that have no connection at all? Well, there is a connection because uh, two things. Number one, everybody was in the house during the lockdown to see it over and over and over and over. People were not going about their normal everyday business. So sometimes you ask the person, did you see that on the news? No, I was busy doing, nobody was busy doing anything. Everybody was home. Everybody saw it. It's number one. Number two, number two everybody had been home so long until when the protest started, there was pent up emotion and people just really wanted to get out. And uh, when people got out, they got out in the hundreds and by the thousands. I just hope that the protest, I was in a march and we did our best to practice social distancing. That doesn't work in a march. Uh, it's hard to do that in a crowd. I kept my face mask on. It's hard to walk 20 blocks in a face mask. So every now and then you have to pull it down to get some breath and put it back on. I do hope that the um, coronavirus doesn't spread because of the uh, protests, but I do think the protests are starting to do some good. There is a social consciousness now among many of our uh, corporations, organizations, and people are looking all over the world saying, you know, is America racist? Have we practiced racism? And we're looking at it like never before. We would not have looked at it if we hadn't seen demonstrations all over the world. I love what you said recently. I'm just going to reference, quote you. You referred to, to Job 121, and then you, um, you know, God gives us breath. Uh, God gives us the right breath. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The most precious thing we have is our breath. Nobody can choke out of you what God has put into you. I love how you used this horrific incident for good. God, God is the giver of breath. And uh, that's the most, that's, that's what, that is the essence of life in a sense. That's what we have. And we have to protect that. And we have to protect all breath, undocumented breath, white breath, black breath. We have to protect all breath. And then the Bible tells us another thing in Psalms 89 and 14, it says that God is a God, the foundations are built on justice and righteousness. So we cannot want what's right without wanting what's just. And it's just fair for uh, a person to be stopped by a police and think you're gonna make it home safely. That's just right, it's just right. And anytime people don't make it home from a police stop, something is wrong. And our whole society has to come together and make sure that we stamp that out. I'm going to, we have just a couple minutes left in this program, and I want you to pray before we end, but I have two more things. One is you served for 10 years as an Illinois state senator. Do changes need to happen through the government? You talked about the church, but in terms of new laws, or will change happen quicker uh, through demands, for instance, at the grassroots level? Change can happen through both areas. Uh, the church can push the government and make the government move. But uh, change can happen. So in our next segment, I want to talk more about government and what government can do. But right now, we need to concentrate on what the church could do. If we're waiting for the government to do it, uh, it's going to be a long time before that happens. Quote from the Reverend James Meeks. I cannot ignore justice. We must fight for justice. Don't sit at home watching TV, talking about people trying to do something. If you're tired of injustice, say so. Say so. 
say so. Of course, you did that with much more personality. Well, the um, Bible says the redeemed of the Lord have to say so. We are saved. We're Christians. And it's time for us to use our voices to speak up. Two minutes left. What's on your heart to pray in this moment with our audience? What would be a prayer that you would share across the globe right now? I would say to, to everybody who's watching, we cannot let this great moment go to waste. We have to get something out of it. The moment of COVID, those of you who are sitting at home, uh, I would encourage you to read some books, read the book, read the books of the Bible, learn the books of the Bible, learn uh, how to quote Bible verses, take advantage of that time. I would say reach out to an unsaved relative who doesn't know the Lord. You get a chance now to spend one hour a week with that relative and talk to them on the phone. The goal should be to win them to the Lord. And I like to say to everybody who's watching, let's take a deep breath and let's hit the reset button and let's realize that now is a wonderful time for us to uh, start all over again and get some things right that we've had wrong for 300 years here in America. Would you lead us in prayer in the next 60 seconds we have to get us started on that journey? I will be glad to our Father and our God, how we love you. Thank you for the TLN family. Thank you for Deborah and our time together. And now I pray, God, that all over the land and country, that you are touching your people everywhere, that you're giving us a heart, that you're giving us a mind to make things right here in our world. God, we want to honor you. We want to glorify you. We want the name of Jesus Christ to be lifted up. You said that we should always pray, and so we're coming to you now. But what we want more than anything else is for your name to be glorified. You said that your light so shine before men that your Father could get the glory. That's all we want is for you to be honored, is for you to be glorified through us and through your church. Thank you for our family at TLN. Let the station always be used to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for being with us. And what I love so much about what I do is being a platform for what you do. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And you can find Pastor James Meeks on TLN every Sunday morning at 11. So be prepared to be inspired. We are in effective in life when we realize change begins within us. And that change is so powerful when it's centered in Christ. And to find out more about the saving grace of Christ, go to tln.com slash salvation and watch our COVID-19 uh, programs daily. You can go to tln.com, tlnwest.tv to find out how, how. Call us for prayer. We're here for you. Stay centered in the Christ we serve.